Ecclesiastes, the preacher. Who is the preacher? Solomon. Well, the, yeah, Solomon. Solomon. Ecclesiastes. Um, if, you, if you have a Schofield, and I am an advocate of the Schofield, old Schofield study Bible. It's the King James Bible. Uh, how you doing, Brother Tim? <laughs> hey, man, if you have an old Schofield, you can go to the introduction there in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, and you can find it's a, it's a book of man under the sun, under the sun in parentheses. In parentheses. And it's reasoning about life. Reasoning about life. And it's, uh, and, and you see that, uh, what he's got down, it's the best man can do. It's the best man can do. Apart from Jesus Christ, it's, this is the best that man can do. And if you have, you have to read the book of Ecclesiastes with that theme in mind. If you don't, it's going to confuse you. It's just like when you study the book of Hebrews, you have to study the book of Hebrews speaking to Christians as going on to perfection or it'll confuse you. Well, the book of Ecclesiastes are some, some, some good thoughts, but the preacher is telling us that he's done everything under the sun. He has tried everything under the sun. He's examined everything under the sun. And he's come to the conclusion that all are vanity, that everything's vanity. We're going back to the dust. But in the end of his book in chapter 12, he, he tells us that the whole duty of man is to fear God and keep his commandments. Say, pardon? The conclusion of the matter. Yeah, conclusion of the matter back in, Hebrew, in, uh, in Ecclesiastes 12. All right, so with that in mind, I want you to turn to Ecclesiastes 11 with the theme of the book. And um, I've titled the message, The Best That Man Can Do. The Best That Man Can Do. It is from man's perspective. The Best That Man Can Do. Now, the Bible says here, Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Give a portion to seven and also to eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if the tree fall toward the south or toward the north, in the place where the tree falleth, there it shall be. He that observeth the wind shall not sow. He that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. As thou knowest not what is the way of the spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. In the morning sow thy seed, and in the evening withhold not thine hand, for thou knowest not whither shall prosper either this or that, or whether they both shall be alike good. Truly the light is sweet and a pleasant thing it is for the eyes to behold the sun. But if a man live many years and rejoice in them all, yet let him remember the days of darkness, for, all, for they shall be many, all that cometh is vanity. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thine heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart, and in the sight of thine own eyes. But know that for all these things, God will bring thee into judgment. Therefore, remove sorrow from thy heart and put away evil from thy flesh, for childhood and youth are vanity. Um, not but ten verses in the chapter, and we'll go back and try to look at them. And I put a title to each, each couple of verses. First of all, we look at, uh, at wisdom and service. Wisdom and service. <clears throat> now, a wise man should take advantage of his opportunities. You agree with that? Now, that's Bible. Not just in Ecclesiastes, that is Bible. You find that in Ephesians chapter number 5 and verse number 16, redeeming the time before the days are evil. So that's seizing the opportunity at hand. Seize the opportunity you have. If you have an opportunity to witness to someone, opportunity to share someone, opportunity to be good to someone, then seize that opportunity because you can't go wrong. If you give a cup of cold water, in Christ's name, you shall in no wise lose your reward. If your enemy gets your coat, give him your cloak also. Pray for your enemy. Pray for those that do good. Pray for those that do evil. Pray that they'll get good. Amen. That's what we should do. So that's wisdom. That's just wisdom. A wise man should take advantage of these opportunities. Now, in Ecclesiastes chapter number 11, beginning with verse number 1 and 2, uh, verse 1 and 2 gives the course or the wise course of action. And simply this, we've read it again in, in verse number 1, Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Um, if a man wants to accomplish anything, he must be willing to invest something. 
Y'all agree with that? Yes, you do. Yeah, I'm getting some, getting some, some people that are listening. If you're willing to accomplish anything, you must be willing to invest something. And that, again, is a Bible principle. In, in Galatians chapter 6, it's a sowing and reaping. Sowing and reaping. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. We talked about Luke 6, 38. Give and it shall be what? Given to you, pressed down, shaken together. God will give you more so you'll be able to give more. And you can give and he'll give more and you'll give more. That's just the way it operates. That's the way God operates. People don't understand that until they participate. They don't understand that until they participate. And when you participate, you take advantage of it, seize the opportunity, then you see what God will do. So if a man wants to accomplish anything, he must be willing to invest something. Now, verse number one, when it says, cast thy bread upon the waters, the farmer who plants his grain at the proper time will harvest enough grain to replace what he saved and also give him a profit. That's just the law of sowing and reaping. Just the law of sowing and reaping. Verse number two by the same token, the Bible said, give a portion to seven, also to eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. Now, by the same token is verse number one, generosity in a wise course, we should be generous. And the Bible says, for, for basically, for man cannot, does not know when tragedy will strike. You, you're not, you don't know when the COVID's going to hit. You didn't know when the famine was going to hit. You didn't know when the stock market's going to crash. You don't know these things. So by the same token, cast your bread upon the waters is what the Bible says and give a portion to seven and also to eight for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. Man does not know when tragedy will strike and he will need the help of others when it does. Now this is just what a preacher is telling you from his experience as a mere human being. He said, I found this to be true. Give a portion to seven, even to eight because when you're, you're in trouble, they'll help you. They'll help you. Now, uh, all, you remember what, what Joseph did. Take, hold your place in Ecclesiastes. Go back to J uh, Genesis 41. I started to say Joseph 41. Genesis, Genesis 41. Genesis, actually look at Genesis 40. And you remember when Joseph was imprisoned, he was sold to the Ishmaelites and, and they brought him down to Egypt and they sold him into Pharaoh's house, I mean into uh, Potiphar's house. And then... Um, some things happened in Potiphar's house and he went to prison. If you'll notice, while he was in prison, he told the, uh, the baker and the, um, the butler and the baker, he told them uh, their dreams. And uh, in verse number 14 of chapter 40, after revealing that dream to him, he said this in verse 14, Joseph said to him, but think on me when it shall be well with thee and show kindness, I pray thee, unto me, and make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. I'm going to help you, you're going to help me. Now, we don't, we don't uh, just help people to get help back, but that's just the law of sowing and reaping. That's just good sense. Now, we're not, we're not talking about, we're not talking about, uh, uh, Solomon's not talking about uh, seeking the Lord and praying, which we should do, but Ecclesiastes is just showing you the basic things that human beings do. Amen. And, and then he says all is vanity. All right. Now, uh, we go on down to verse number 23. But the, after it all happened, the butler was restored. Verse number 23 of, of chapter 40 said, yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. All right. Then we get to verse 9 of Genesis chapter 41. And something happened the uh, Pharaoh had a dream, and then verse number nine, the chief then the, then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, "I do remember my faults this day." And then he went back to Joseph, the, the dreamer, the interpreter, the interpreter. And so we know what happened after that. He became Pharaoh's right hand man. All right, now there's another illustration I want to give you as well. Uh, when, you're, when you're doing good deeds, be sure to help more than one person is what Ecclesiastes is saying. You help more than one person, and uh, you help, actually, you help quite a few. Uh, uh, sometimes, now just be careful and use discernment. Sometimes you get in trouble, most of the time you don't. Uh, then there's going to be a people willing to help you. It's called redeeming the time because the days are evil. And so we t seize the opportunity. There's another illustration I want to give you over in Luke 16. Luke 16. And I used to have a hard time with Luke chapter number 16 
until I realized what he was talking about. Same thing Solomon's talking about in Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Over in Luke chapter number 16, the Bible says, talks about an unjust steward. And uh, let's begin in verse number 1 of Luke 16. It says, And he said unto his disciples, There was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods, that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer a steward. All right, so, so uh, the steward said within himself in verse 3, what shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship I cannot dig, and to beg I'm ashamed. I am resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him, and said unto the first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, and sit down quickly, and write fifty. Well, man alive, I've made a friend right there. Just give me half what you owe me, or half what you owe my Lord. Now, this, really, this guy's a crook. Okay, but I'm going to show you what the Lord said about him. And the Lord is not advocating you being a crook either. Okay, all right. Now, let's go on. And in verse number 7, then said he to another, And how much owest thou? And he said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill and write four score. That's was 80. And the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely for the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. The Lord, dogmatically I state this, the Lord was not commending him for being unjust, but he, but in other words, thinking how to use and to handle finances. And so the wit and not the goodness of man was commended right here. Not, not, not him being a crook. All right, and then the Bible goes on to say um, in verse 9, And I say unto you, unto you, make to yourself friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. Mammon in this case, of course, being money and finances. Um, it didn't, say the, it didn't say that money was bad. The Bible says the love of money is bad. But make friends so in times of trials and distress and famines and everything that hits, and this COVID has put a lot of people out of work. And uh, we're to make the Bible, talk. this is a good, good illustration right here. Make friends that, that uh, when, when you're having uh, bad times that people will come to your rescue as well. The Bible said in verse 10, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, and he that is unjust in least is unjust also in much. If there, and there's your lesson right there now. If, there, if therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? If you can't be faithful with what you operate in the world and your finances, how you give to God and everything else, and God's not going to trust you with the true riches. Is what he's saying. And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you what which is your own? So I hope you, I hope you get that right there. Back in Ecclesiastes chapter number 11, in verse number 2, it's the same thing. Give a portion to seven and also to eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall befall upon the earth. Same, same principle in, in uh, Genesis 40, 41, same principle in Luke chapter number 16. And we talked about the un, unjust steward. And again, Jesus did not come in and don't leave here saying, my preacher said it was all right to, to be crooked. I did not say that. Amen. And I'm not saying that to anybody looking at me either. Amen. I'm not saying that. Um, Jesus didn't commend that steward for robbing his master or for encouraging others to be dishonest. Jesus commended simply this, the man for his wise use of opportunity. And don't, and uh, back to Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse number one, don't be afraid of doing good, although the reward may be late in arriving. Cast your bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Don't be alarmed if it comes. By the way, I found this. It'll come on time. It'll, it'll come on time. Uh, that's what it always does. All right, so we had wisdom and service. And then in verse 3 and 4, we have wisdom and the inevitable. Wisdom and the inevitable. Look at verse 3 and 4. 
If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if the tree fall toward the south or toward the north in the place where the tree falleth, there it shall be. We use that verse a lot saying you better make a decision for Christ because uh, once you're gone, you can't make a decision. That's where the tree falls. That's where it's going to lay. Amen. You're, I've never seen anybody pick up a big old redwood or a big old cedar of Lebanon and, and pick it up and replant the thing. When it falls, it falls. And uh, when you're gone, you're gone. There's no second chances. No second chances in hell. Amen. So make that choice now where the tree falls. Anyway, verse 4 said, He that observeth the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the cloud shall not reap. Wisdom and the inevitable. Now, in verse number 3, when the rains come, they fall where they will. Sometimes they cause tragedy. We've seen that in the floods and the storms and so on and hurricanes. Man cannot prevent rainfall. And when a tree falls, no man can set it back to live and grow again. And so these simple realities that the Bible gives us ought to cause us to consider our own state. Our own state. So don't let the opportunity pass while it's time, while it's day, do the work. Because there's coming a night when no man can work. When we let opportunities slip by... And do not redeem or seize the opportunity. You never get them again. You never get them again. Tonight, Sunday night, 12 midnight. Sunday's gone. 12.01, we have Monday. What did you let slip, slip through your fingers on Sunday? Because Monday will be here before you know it. So take, seize the opportunity. Do what you can. The inevitable as a tree. This is what um, uh, a fellow named John Ray wrote. Uh, the inevitable. As a tree falls, so must it lie. As a man live, lives, so must he die. As a man dies, so must he be. All through the years of eternity. Amen. That would make a good song, wouldn't it? All right. Then we have not wisdom and the inevitable. Then we have wisdom and the unknowable. Wisdom and the unknowable. Unless you can find a better word that'll work. Wisdom and the unknowable. Verse 5 and 6. As thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. In the morning sow thy seed, and in the evening withhold not thine hand, for thou knowest not whether shall prosper either this or that, or whether they both shall be alike good. You don't know. You just don't know, do you? Wisdom and the unknowable. In verse number five, there are some, th some things we do not know and we can't comprehend. Brother Joe Soller said that. I don't know. I can't comprehend some things that are happening to our folks here at the church. I just can't. I don't know that. I can pray. And uh, Brother Kennedy made a comment that uh, God is almighty. God is all sufficient. God is God. And God trumps and supersedes anybody else. And so that's, a, that's an honest statement. So we, but we don't know Sometimes we just don't know what God's will is. Moses said, let me live. And, and um, God said, speak no more to me of this matter. Hezekiah said, I want to live. And God said, you got 15 years. Uh, Paul healed some people. Some people he didn't. He left Trophimus at Miletum nigh, sick unto death. Sick nigh unto death is what the Bible says. But yet he healed some more. Why didn't Paul just heal him? You know, I, I don't know some, I don't know, I've got to be honest with you, I've been preaching a long time, not as long as some of you have, I'm looking over here, amen, not as long as some of you have, but uh, I do know this, I, I wonder some things that I, I wonder, I don't know, but I, what I do know is what I'm going to preach. What you do know is what you're dogmatic on, and of course we're very, very dogmatic on the way to, to know the Lord Jesus Christ to go to heaven, the all-sufficiency of Christ. It's nothing you can do. We know that. We know these things, and we need to tell what we know. Just tell what you know. Don't try to be something you're not. The wisdom and the unknowable. Verse number six, there are some things I do know. There are some things I do know. We act upon what we know, and that's the, by the way, acting on what you know is the essence of living by faith, or just acting on the Word of God. Amen? Acting on the Word of God. If God says whatever, and we could go from Genesis to Revelation and pick out a sentence, any sentence in any verse, if God says, then, then act, we have substance. We have, so we're going to act on what we know. But there's just some things I do not know. And by the way, acting on what you know is the essence of living by faith. Some people will never venture into a, a, uh, uh, 
a particular deed or a particular job because they don't know all about it. And I've been like that, and you've been like that. You've turned down some jobs, I'm sure, in your life. Um, and I've turned down some. Uh, some I wish I'd have got, and some the Lord kept me from getting. Uh, different things in my life. So I remember those, I remember those times. I, I do know this, the Lord knows best. I don't know all about it, but possessing simply the basic fundamentals of it, just the simple fundamentals of it. I didn't know all about it, but I'd convinced myself that I could be good at it. And this is just the thoughts of man that we're expressing here in Ecclesiastes chapter number 11. Now, let me make something spiritual, right? give you a spiritual application right here. Um, you're here tonight, you're sitting on pews or sitting on chairs. You're sitting on chairs and all you needed to know is that those chairs will hold your weight. You never thought one second about what kind of material they're made out of. I knew the fundamentals of it. So I can act on what I know. I don't know eschatology and uh, I don't know certain things in the Bible. You may say, uh, I teach eschatology in, in, in our Bible college, but I'm sort of certain things I don't know. I, I, I guarantee you one thing, that I got one amen on, I don't know English. I don't know English, but uh, there's some certain things I do know, and I'm going to act on the fundamentals of it, on the fundamentals of it, and, and uh, that's what we need to do. Don't let what you do not know disturb what you do know, amen? According to Philippians chapter number four and verse number nine, there's a word in that verse. It talks about think on these things, and it names off several things. And then what you've seen and heard in me, there's one word, do, do, do what you know, do, do what you know, amen, your responsibility, you know it's your responsibility if you're a father to take care of your children and your family, you know it's your responsibility as a husband, take care of your wife, you know it's your responsibility in both aspects, in both offices, you know it's responsibility to teach your children spiritual things and to teach your family spirit, you know that, fulfill your responsibility, fulfill those things you know. You say, well, I don't really know how to teach them yet. I didn't either. So you know what I did? I took them to church. And there I learned the responsibilities I needed to teach my family and, and, and the, the, what I needed to teach them. And I learned about finances. And I learned about things of the Lord in church. I, that's where I learned. So I love my church. I love the church. I love the local assembly. I love the body of Christ. So there's some things that we learn. And so act on what you know. Now, for... Christians, what we know and depend on God to help us through it, and God will give us that wisdom and knowledge to act. See, I already know, I've read some, I've read some passages, and especially in the last few years, and so have you, things that we're going through, we realize that we're in a storm and uh, we're to get in the boat, but we have a promise of God that we're getting to the other side. Now, I don't know what's going to happen between there and the other side. Because I'm not to bring into today the evils of tomorrow. Today's got enough evil sufficient for the day thereof. But I do know this. I do know that I'm going to get out on the other side. And you know that if you're a child of God. So it's just that journey in between that's kind of, kind of scary sometimes. Amen. And we learned that in Acts chapter 27. We learned it in Luke chapter number 8 and 10 and so on. We, we just learn these things. How do we learn? From the Word of God. We do know and depend on God and how God will get us through. All right. Now, wisdom of life. Wisdom and life. Wisdom and life. Wisdom and knowledge. Wisdom and the inevitable. Wisdom and the unknowable. And then in verse 7 and 8, wisdom and life. Wisdom and life. The Bible says in verse 7 and 8, <clears throat> Truly the light is sweet, and a pleasant thing it is for the eyes to behold the sun. But if a man live many years and rejoice in them all, yet let him remember the days of darkness, for they shall be many. All that cometh is vanity, wisdom, and life. Now, it's unquestionable that we do learn from contrast. We learn from our own life, the contrast in life. We learn what happens when we do it God's way, and we learn what happens when we don't do it God's way. 
There's a contrast there. So let me just make a simple statement again. It's unquestionable that we do learn from contrasts. We appreciate and enjoy more fully the good things of life. The, and when we can do that and how we can do that is when we do not fail to remember the bad things. What do I have to contrast the good things to? Then I have to remember the bad things. Some bad things I don't want to remember and you don't want to remember either. But we do. So when we think about the bad things and then we shift to the good things, it makes those good things even better. In life, my wife and I have been married 40, 40, thank you, 45 years. Yeah, Brother Dana has been married 45 years. 45 years, and, and some of you have been married longer than I have. Some a lot longer uh, than I've been married. But in 45 years, we've had nothing but good times. But the, good, but the good times outweigh the bad times. If you think about some bad times that you went through in life, you can always contrast them to the good times. And the good times are better. The good times, the good times are better. And so we have wisdom and life. And, we, uh, and then in verse number seven, uh, if, we, if we live many years and experience sweetness through all of our years, According to verse number eight, still we should remember the days of darkness. You lived your whole life and you've experienced nothing but sweetness. We still remember the days of darkness, the days of darkness, because we do not fully appreciate the good unless we remember the bad. I, I've said that. Remembering dark days help us to appreciate the bright days more and more and more and more and more. There's a lesson right there. We greet each new day should be a lesson got out of this anyway, received from this. And the lesson is, is we look at each new day with a positive attitude. And then at the end of verse number eight, again, the end of verse number eight is in view of a natural man. Now we talked about everything, but at the very end it says all that cometh is what? Is vanity. So we're looking at what a, just a, a normal, natural Man, And by the way, there's some, I got this in quotations now, there's some good moral lost people. Fact is, I've heard, I've heard people comments on, on a lost person's life is more exemplary than they said a saved person's life was. And they're talking about contrasting right there. It shouldn't be that way. It should not be that way. Because you've trusted Christ, you ought to be at your best. You're a light. You're salt of the earth. That's what the Bible says. But still, we're still looking at the end right here. I mean, we're looking at a natural man's attitude. And, and then the end is inevitable. We all lay down in the dust alike. The, the good man, the moral man lays down, and the evil man lays down in the dust alike. The saved man is going to face that day one day. He's going to face when he's going to lay down in the desert. He's going to die. He's going to, uh, I like what the Bible says in the New Testament about Christians that die. They go to sleep. They, they sleep. And, and, and we don't believe in soul sleep either. But the Bible just uses that term. It's a good, sweet term to use. We, we sleep. Our, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And one day that body is going to be resurrected. We're going to be given a glorified body. I'm not going into eschatology. But... But we both lay down, the, 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 the good moral man lays down in the dust. Now his soul goes somewhere else other than yours if you're saved. Uh, but the saved man, his soul goes to heaven. You got the mean man who's going to lay down there. This never trusted Christ, been honoring all of his life, mean and, and, and hateful and nasty and hurt people. And never trusted Christ, well he, he's going to wake up in hell. That's, I mean, it's, if he's never trusted Christ. But then I've seen people that have trusted Christ that's been mean and honoring and hateful. It shouldn't be that way either. All right, and uh, <clears throat> as we, <laughs> I don't, I don't like confessions. We get older, we tend to get a little bit more honorary. Yeah, get a little bit more honorary. Um, yeah, we do. But I'm reminded from the scripture to remind myself and remind my wife. My wife reminds me that we don't want to grow old honorary. We want to grow sweeter as we get older. 
So you, it takes a little effort, a little work. Amen. All right. Then closing in Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Well, no, let me talk about lay down in the dust of light. Uh, let me just prove something else to you. Go over here to Job. Go to Job 21. <laughs> Amen. Job 21. Job saying the same thing that the preacher saying in Ecclesiastes in um, verse 23. Well, look at verse 22. Shall any teach God knowledge, seeing he judgeth those that are high? One dieth in his full strength, being wholly at ease and quiet. His breasts are full of milk, and his bones are moistened with marrow. And another dieth in the bitterness of his soul, and never eateth with pleasure. But what does verse 26 say? They shall lie down alike in the dust, and the worms shall cover them. I've, I've been to hospitals, and some people just hold your hand and smile. I've, I've, I've held, I don't know how many hands that they took their last breath. Some people smile and just go out into eternity. And it's, 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 and you walk away, I walk away, thinking how peaceful, how satisfied and content. But then I've been with those that die in the bitterness of their soul. They're hurting so bad that they're just, they're gnarled and they hurt and they're suffering. And, uh, and they leave in the bitterness of their soul. Doesn't mean they wasn't saved. It, it just, it doesn't mean that. It just means that one dies peaceful, the other one dies in agony. That's what the preacher's saying. That's what he found out. That's what he found out in his human life as a natural man, as, as thinking as a natural man. He sought to seek out everything under the sun. All right, verse 9 and 10. Verse 9 and 10 of Ecclesiastes 11. That's the end of the verse, the end of the chapter. Verse 9 and 10, Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart and the sight of thine eyes. But know that thou, that uh, for all these things, God will bring thee into judgment. Ecclesiastes, again, deals with the natural man and his philosophies of life. Pretty much, pretty much the natural man, as we look at Ecclesiastes, lives apart from Christ and focuses his energies and his interests upon this life and this life alone. And that's what we're looking at in Ecclesiastes. Now, the natural man, again, may be pleasing and live a better life than those who profess Christ. Yet for all of his goodness, all of this natural man's goodness, and all of his helping people, giving, you know, Cornelius was a good man before he got saved. And I'm using good in the expression of alms and deeds. But he didn't stop there. Sometimes you'll use good and you'll, people say, there's nobody good but one. Well, let me just tell you, if you're saved, God made you good. So you're looking at a good man. Amen. I'm good. Why? Because Christ is in me. There's nothing good in my flesh, but Christ is good. And he is in me. His seed is in me. All right. Now. Christ wasn't honorary. I am. Sometimes. sometimes. All right, now, Ecclesiastes, uh, the natural man may be pleasing to live a better life uh, than those that profess Christ, yet for all of his goodness, he is still dead in his sins and needs a Savior. This, this natural man that sought out everything in life, found out it was all vanity, all vanity, he, that, that person that he describes still needs a Savior. And if we're not careful, we can get so caught up in being a good person that we'll forget. And how in the world can you not preach the gospel if, if it's there, it jumps out at you? Because when you get to verse number 9, but know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. My, my. I mean, you preacher, you just messed up a good sermon there, trying to feel good sermon. But now look at, the, look at verse, uh, verse 9. Verse 9, you're going to be brought into judgment. You're going to be in the judgment seat of Christ. You're going to be at the great white throne. Which one are you going to be at? Your decision on this side of the grave, while the tree's still standing, your decision will mark where you're going and what judgment seat you're going to be standing at. 1 Corinthians 3 is for Christians. 
to be judged for the works in the flesh, to receive rewards going in the millennium and crowns. The great white throne is lost people only. They're, God's going to show them the books. Their name is not in the book of life and they will be bound hand and foot and cast into the lake of fire. That's what now, the, the preacher makes sure he puts that in. In verse number 9. In verse number 9. Well, verse number 10, Therefore remove sorrow from thine heart and put away evil from thy flesh for childhood and youth or vanity. All right, but now the preacher did get it right and all that he messed up in and we know Solomon, or we've heard of him. He was the wisest man that ever lived besides Christ. But he ended it right in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So make your choice on this side of the grave and pray that you will trust Christ. Christ is all sufficient. He did satisfy God. I promise you that. This Bible says it. He did pay your sin debt. He paid a debt that you could not pay. And by the way, we were the guilty ones. We were the guilty ones. And beyond a shadow of a doubt, we all deserve hell. But Christ loved us so much that he paid our debt for us. And people say, well, if he knew he was going to sin, why'd he do all that? Well, look how much he loves you. That offsets everything. He knew we were going to sin, yet he already worked out a plan to die on Calvary and take care of your sin so you of your own volition could love him. Love him back and want to spend, spend eternity with him. And I hope you do. I hope every one of you do. You want to spend eternity with Christ. And you can if you want. Trust him as your Savior. Let's stand to our feet and we'll be dismissed.